Hey, I'm Gary Langer, Langer Research Associates. I'm here with my buddy Rob Santos to talk about his career in research. Rob is a chief survey methodologist at the Urban Institute. He's a former president of APOR. He's vice president of the American Statistical Association, winner of its Founders Award, uh, uh, a fellow of the American Statistical Association, and a longtime uh, APOR member and friend to us all. We're happy to be with you. I'm happy to be here. So, Rob, before I ask you how a boy from the barrio in <laughs> San Antonio got into survey research, I want to ask you what it was like growing up there. It was, uh, it was quite an experience. It was during the 60s when I was a kid. Uh, both my parents worked. Uh, they were lucky enough to get jobs at Kelly Air Force Base. They were civil servants, but that meant that we were latchkey kids. And so the summers were just incredible. <laughs> we would literally vanish from the face of the earth uh, about 8 a.m. and then return at 4.59 uh, right before they got home. So I had a lot of freedom, had a lot of adventures. Um, there were some tough times, and but you know that's all part of growing up. It was, but it was good overall. You liked the neighborhood? Uh, yeah, the neighborhood was good. Uh, you know, typical barrio neighborhood. I uh, had a little uh, man-made lake a few uh, blocks away where I learned how to fish with my mom's uh, tortilla masa. And uh, we just, you know, uh, I, we kept that. I, uh, me and my neighbor who I grew up with have uh, kept that tradition of going fishing every year since we learned as six-year-olds how to start fishing. <laughs> I know you were a kid, but did you experience any sort of systemic lack of opportunity, any... Uh, any of uh, those sorts of realizations that we sometimes reach about our condition that informs our lives as we go? Uh, yes, uh, but I've, I've never tried to make that uh, a meaningful part of my life. I simply persevered on. Uh, for the most part, uh, we were, I was a bit protected, uh, which was a little good and a little bad, uh, in that I went to 12 years of parochial school. So I had the Irish nuns the first eight years, and then I uh, went to the Brothers of the Holy Cross in San Antonio uh, for the last four years. Uh, but we got into plenty of mischief <laughs> uh, in there. Uh, in terms of society, there were times where, um, uh, where it was clear that we were uh, not supposed to be in certain parts of town. Um, and, but you know, that's, that was part of the culture back then, and we persevered and got through it. I was fortunate enough, though, to be one of the last beneficiaries of the um, affirmative action uh, uh, gifts, so to speak, you know, and uh, I was able to go to school because of that, to go to college. That's great. And I, I very much appreciate that. And I've tried to pay it forward since then, by the way. Well, I ask, because it, it seems to me, and we'll talk about this more later, but as I look at your career and the sorts of projects mm -hmm. in which you've immersed yourself, a lot of them has to do with give, giving voice to the dispossessed and the underserved in our communities. And uh, I wonder where that came from. Uh, it's, it's weird. It probably came from uh, the values that were, uh, that were embedded as part of the parochial upbringing. Uh, even though I'm not a practicing religious person at all, but I retain those values, and and they've I think they've worked really well for me, and uh, I'm I part of my life now has been devoted to helping people, and that's actually how my career path went. I I chose not to be explicitly not to be sort of the person out front, uh, being the either the methodological researcher or the PI, although. I've departed from that a little more recently, uh, but um, instead to be the person that provides the best sound counsel and make sure that things get done right. And so, and also give a helping hand to uh, like the young kiddos that are coming up in the world and, and give them advice and options and point them to opportunities and such. So I've done a lot of that and it's been very rewarding. Yeah. And I thank my, my, uh, my upbringing for that and then my schooling. Cool. So uh, I, I've heard the nuns are good at drilling math into kids, and I think you did okay in math. As a student. Yeah, math was my absolute passion, and uh, I wanted to be a math professor. So um, I, uh, I took as many math courses as I could, um, even some logic courses. And to me, the logic courses were what, by the way, what made me, a, I think, a good manager <laughs> and administrator. Um, especially in crisis situations. At what age did it come to you that math was your... Uh, that was math? around fifth grade. 
Yeah, fifth grade, yeah. Even though in sixth grade, I and a buddy tried to do everything we could to get thrown out of school, and we weren't successful. <laughs> but we turned around. <laughs> Great. And I think you said your dad was a draftsman, which is uh, a precision kind of occupation. Do you, do you think some of uh, those skills that he had came down to you? Yes, I, I think it's built into the genes. Uh, he very much enjoyed uh, mathematics, trigonometry, which was really big. Uh, in terms of the designs that he made for tools for the big uh, C-8 airlines uh, aircraft. And um, I, he would instill in me and ask me questions uh, when, when I would come home uh, about mathematics, you know, like, well, what's the cosine of, you know, pi over two or something? And, uh, and that just triggered a, a real a genuine spark in mathematics. Uh, so I wanted to be a math professor, and I ended up being an applied statistician. <laughs> Go okay. figure, right? Yeah. So, so uh, you got through high school and realized late in the game that maybe college would not be a bad idea. That's right. How'd that happen? Uh, well, I uh, I always wanted to be a math professor, and so coming on to college, I mean, coming uh, out of high school, I figured um, I'd apply to uh, the universities in the summer and get in in the September. It just didn't work out that way. <laughs> I didn't know that you had to apply the fall before uh, in order to get into school. <laughs> Guidance counselor staff in Abadio maybe wasn't quite up to speed. Uh, no, and, and they, they probably assumed that I knew better, but I didn't. Yeah. And uh, since uh, none of, at that point, uh, none of my parents had gone to, you know, gone to college, much less my dad went to eighth through eighth grade. Uh, my mom got out of high school but never went, out of, uh, went to, to college. And so we just didn't know. <laughs> And, uh, and so I ended up going to junior college and then transferring to, to a, a good liberal arts school, which really helped me along. And what school was it? That was Trinity University in San Antonio. So what were your experiences there? Well, by th it, interestingly, by then I was married because I got married at 18. And so um, still married today, you know, 40 something years. And um, I was the oddball uh, community kid that they let in because Trinity's mostly, I hate to say, rich white school. And, um, and at that time they would let in some community kids and I happened to be one of them. Um, it was a pretty isolated experience because I couldn't, you know, do the things that normal 18 year old kids do because I had a wife and, you know, it was great. You know, I, I totally loved the experience, but it was very much uh, it actually helped me focus on what I wanted to do because I'd go in, take classes, get out, and move on with life. So. And did they have the breadth and depth of coursework that you were looking for? Uh, actually, they did. It was a good, solid liberal arts school. Uh, it taught me some really good stuff. I took all the math classes I could to the point that I was taking self, what do they, what do they call it, the, the self-teach, you know, uh, self-taught things where you, you just, you and the professor meet every once a week or whatever. I took a number of those classes. It was really exceptional. Okay, so at some point in this experience, you decide maybe, or, or maybe someone told you that maybe being a math teacher wasn't the best choice. Yeah, that, that that's right. I um, I actually did pretty good on my GREs. I did like 85, you know, not fantastic, 85 percentile on the mathematics. Uh, I was ready to be to go to grad school as a math to, to be a math professor. Uh, didn't do too well on verbal though. I think I did 29 percentile. <laughs> <laughs> what the heck? Um, so I, I waltz into this to, to, to my, my math major's uh, professor's uh, office, and I said, I want to be a math, math professor. And he said, nope, nope, son, you don't have it. <laughs> I said, what? <laughs> I, I aced all these courses, man. Why how did you do that? He said, you need to go into something more applied, like statistics. You'll always have a job. It'll be good for you. And so I ended up applying to stat departments and got into the University of Michigan on a minority fellowship. And that's how I ended up at University of Michigan. So. Well, all right, that takes you to Michigan, mm -hmm. and it takes you to stats, but we haven't arrived at survey research yet. Yeah, well, uh, I didn't, since I didn't know much, uh, I just wanted to like get out of Texas. I'd never been north of Dallas. And so Michigan was my first experience of that. And uh, I went there, and lo and behold, the stats department was a break off of the math department. And so there were all these wonderful graduate math courses, you know, real analysis, topography, functional analysis. 
I was in absolute heaven doing proofs and everything, learning stuff that only a handful of people in the world know. <laughs> and uh, lo and behold, I get a call from uh, a Latino researcher named Carlos Arce at the Institute for Survey, uh, Social, Survey Re no, Social Research, ISR Michigan, at the Survey Research Center. And he, and he, brought, he was bringing in all the Latino graduate students he could find because he had gotten a grant from NIMH, Mental Health, uh, National Institutes of Mental Health, to do the first ever survey of people of Mexican descent national. Area probability, face-to-face -face interviewing, the whole shebang. And when he found out that there was a statistician, <laughs> a Latino grad student, he, he brought me in. And I, and I sat down with him, and he said, and I, he said what are you going to do when you grow up type of thing? And I said, oh, I, I want to you know, be a math, you know, essentially a math professor, a stat professor. And he said, no, 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 no. You really need to give back to the community. This is our chance. Come, we'll learn together. We'll do this and that, et cetera. And so he convinced me in an hour to go into survey research, and he waltzed me down into Leslie Kish's office uh, in the sampling department, and he said, I want this kid to, to draw the sample, to design and draw the sample for the National Chicano Study. And uh, he and Irene has said, no, no, ain't going to happen. But what we, we will do is we'll let him in to ISR. Uh, he has to take the Summer Institute which included a workshop for foreign statisticians. So you get to learn all these great things with like Marty Frankel and Colm Mercury and Graham Calton and all these guys. And then he can work with Bob Groves and co-design and select the sample. And so that's what ended up happening. That's amazing. Yeah. I, and I know that Carlos Arce is going to resurface in your life as we'll get He that. certainly did. Yeah. <laughs> so so uh, what, what, about what year was this? Uh, this was 77. So when you're working with, we're, we're getting Waltz mm -hmm. to Leslie Kish's office in 1977, did you have any sense of who Leslie Kish was and what he was? I had no idea. So <laughs> Absolutely no idea. <laughs> probably would have been terrified otherwise. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I, was, I was a young whippersnapper. I was just take everything in turn. Um, and it, it actually, it taught me a great lesson, uh, which was that when opportunity arises, and it's not necessarily in exactly what you want to do, but the same general direction. You should you should seize it. And I did that a number of times throughout my career, and I think it got me to a good place. So it's neat because okay. we're talking about improvising. We've gone from math teacher to applied statistics. We just landed at ISR and doing survey research. Yeah, it was great. It was a wonderful learning experience. Yeah. Well, what about that project itself that turned you on? What What were the most rewarding pieces of that? Uh, actually, just the the, the whole. Thing of developing a national design and then uh, sampling, you know, counties and then block groups and you know things of that sort. Doing the sketches, sending people out to, and they were uh, basically they would do grad students, Latino grad students. We'd send them out to do the listing all over the country, and uh, we were so naive about how to do rare element sampling that we let everything have a chance of selection, even if there were only a few people of Spanish descent. And so we ended up with uh, uh, a county near Wheeling, West Virginia. And I, uh, my wife was in school at the time with me at Michigan. And so she and uh, a fellow, uh, one of our fellow uh, students, schlepped out in a van, a rickety van, to Wheeling, West Virginia in the mountains and went looking for housing units to, <laughs> to enumerate. <laughs> it was great. They didn't, and then we sent interviewers out there, and naturally they didn't find any, any Mexican, people of Mexican descent. But it, it taught me a great lesson that when it comes to rare element sampling, it is totally acceptable to incur some non-coverage. And uh, that was my great great learning out of that and uh, I it actually is part of the my contribution I think to the survey research world is that we pioneered uh, rare element sampling and specifically sampling of blacks and Hispanics which I ended up doing a lot more when I went over to uh, Temple University at the Institute for Survey Research. Yeah. So you finished your master's at Michigan mm -hmm. and from there did you think about going on a PhD program? Oh, uh, actually, yeah, actually, I did. Uh, uh, my intention all along was to get a PhD, and uh, I worked under Graham Calton and Bill Erickson, who's a famous Bayesian statistician, by the way, and got maybe halfway or so through a dissertation, and 
then took a job as the sampling statistician at the uh, at ISR Temple because Gene Erickson, who's an amazing sampling statistician and sociologist, uh, had just left there and they needed somebody. And because of my pedigree at ISR, learning with Leslie, he, uh, Gene uh, Erickson was a, uh, one of his, uh, Leslie's protégés. Um, they just, they said, please come help us out. And so I went there intending to finish and I, I didn't. So uh, for a while I'd always say I'm uh, ABD and I, after a few years, I just dropped that. I'm a master's, <laughs> master's statistician, level statistician, period. <laughs> you seem to have struggled through life pretty well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> poor me. So Temple, what, what appealed to you about that position? Uh, it was a genuine sampling statistician uh, position in a survey research operation that had something that very few uh, academically based survey research centers had which was a national area probability frame, which was selected every 10 years. And you select it and then you, oh, the idea is to maintain a stable field interviewer force. And the way you do that isn't by hiring from scratch each time you do a national survey, it's by sampling the counties and then the you know, uh, places inside, and then identifying and training field staff within those counties that you're then going to use for the next 10 years over multiple surveys. And so that really appealed to me, and I got to draw a national uh, area sample frame, which is, was just amazing and a lot of fun. So you're talking area probability, face-to-face -face interviews. Old school, man. <laughs> yeah. We're getting, but we're getting into the late 70s, early 80s? Uh, yeah, this was like 82 to 89 I was there. Okay, so so telephones are starting to crop up as a possible sampling uh -huh. frame. How did that transition hit you and how did you manage? Uh, by, by the time I went to, uh, to Temple, they had the beginnings of a telephone operation and it, we just slid right into it. It was no big deal at all. Um, however, uh, it, there were some interesting things uh, going on. Uh, let's see. The, there was telephone sampling. Oh, uh, when I was there at Temple, I, you know, I was doing all the sampling. You know, I basically walked into an empty office, an empty area, and built it up. Uh, and we started getting business. And I kept thinking to myself, what are what are the implications of the sampling that I'm drawing? I mean, I'm basically sitting in an office. People say, okay, we need a random sample of this and an oversample of that. And I'd say, here, here you go. Here's you know the stuff. Go out, go get them. And I, I thought to myself, I really need to understand the. In order to be a better sampling statistician, I need to understand the implications of the decisions I'm making in my closet office type of thing. And so I decided to become a project director. And so I started directing projects in uh, you know soup to nuts from uh, client interaction to overall research design, uh, training the interviewers, going out to different spots all over the country with you know, 50 to 100 interviewers and doing multi-day trainings and doing all that stuff. And I discovered I really loved it. You <laughs> so. know, it's interesting. You make that sound like a clear, simple, and easy path. But to me, this is like a key insight of your career, the point at which you quit being just the numbers guy and you move the numbers off the page and into the field. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That makes all the difference. It does. It, it really It was eye-opening very insightful and it, it opened my mind and allowed me to do some a lot more be a more creative sampler and research designer and to me one of my biggest uh, what I feel my biggest assets is uh, is uh, bringing some creativity and just wild and crazy ideas to just about anything I do. <laughs> do you think your wife's road trip to West Virginia that you described sort of as Lit that spark in you to see get out in the field yourself. Yeah, she came back and gave me an earful. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out that that van she had uh, didn't have very good brakes, and they would be going down down these mountains, stepping on the brakes, and the like the the lights would brake lights would go on. She thought she was going to die. <laughs> <laughs> Poor thing. Yeah. So but she's still with me, so yeah, <laughs> I must cool. have done something right. But but that transition, I think, to project management and getting out into the fields, uh -huh. interviewer trainings and. Were you out there with, with, with the interviewers doing respondent selection? Doing yep, interviews? yep, absolutely. Uh, no, I wasn't doing, I would never do interviews. Um, 
I would leave that to the to the professionals. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I would I would train them on listing and and uh, walk with them and uh, you know follow them around and uh, it it was just a good experience. What did yeah. you learn from that that you didn't learn from the books? Uh, I learned that that people are very innovative and that um, the interviewers there are some who absolutely care and they are golden. Uh, there are some that don't care and you got to watch out for them. <laughs> uh, and I actually was able to 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 create some tricks of the trade to identify sophisticated cheaters and things of that sort. It was it was very eye opening. So um, I learned the appreciation of the of a good field force. Um, Mostly. Mm. That's great. So mm. seven years at Temple, did any of the ones that really caught your imagination? Uh, yeah, there, there were a couple. Um, uh, the first, m my very first project was a 17,000 in-person survey of new uh, beneficiaries for the Social Security. And it was so gigantic that we teamed with Mathematica. And Mathematica did half the sample and, or implemented half the sample. We implemented half. And it was just, uh, it was to go from, uh, you know, I think it was like a 3,000 uh, survey face-to-face uh, uh, -face with uh, the National Chicano Study to suddenly a 17,000 <laughs> in-person survey was quite a leap. And I was responsible for, for all of the sampling there. Uh, although Gene, Gene had, had done uh, quite a bit, but uh, I took it over and then, and then ran with it. Uh, so that was, a, that was a good one. Um, that, and uh, then there was the national, uh, they called it National Household Drug Abuse Study, but it, it's now called NISDA. But in 84, the, that was the, uh, I got to design the very first one uh, of that uh, series that included oversamples of blacks and Hispanics. So it was a really nice, uh, uh, complex design that involved solving uh, simultaneous e equations in order to, to, to do the, uh, the different pr uh, sampling rates for the uh, whites, uh, uh, African Americans, and Hispanics. And the way back then, since we didn't have technology back then, how we would do it is we'd have these colored screening forms. And a green one meant everybody's you know, eligible. Uh, a blue one meant African Americans and Hispanics are eligible, and the red ones meant only Hispanics. And then the idea was to randomly mix those in certain proportions so that overall everybody got their chance of selection. That's how, how we did our oversampling. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, it's really neat. Did, did you guys or your team do anything as you're extending these survey instruments to a broader population that uh -huh. might otherwise have been focused on, or certainly in terms of oversampling, did you? take a look at the instruments and work the questionnaires to make sure that the people you're interviewing get where you're coming from? Uh, yes, we d I, did, I did some of that. I did much more of it later on um, at, um, at Michigan, at NORC, and at Urban Institute, and Neustadt's where, where I had a, a co-owned a company. Um, but uh, that's, that's where I really got into the questionnaire design. Uh, back then, I let the field staff do their thing. Um, it was it was pretty um, stovepipe, uh, you know. There was a sampling section, a field section, a coding section, and uh, you you know you tried not to mess in other people's business. And so I didn't I didn't do that. <laughs> so what took you out of Temple? Uh, the an offer I couldn't refuse. Um, uh, the Survey Research Center at Michigan was creating the first ever director of survey operations position. And uh, I decided to go after it, and uh, they, for whatever reason, picked me. <laughs> and I actually, I think the reason they picked me was because I had uh, one is you know I was there and I knew how the place ran, uh, but I was I was a product of their sampling department, and it was the samplers that were making the decisions, <laughs> like Bob Rose and some other guys. Um, but also because I had an ex uh, a pretty good depth of experience as a project director. So I knew what a good proposal looked like. I knew what a good survey operation looked like. I knew the back end, the front end, as well as the sampling. And I think that really, uh, that helped. And, and that allowed me to go there. And I was there for seven years. And that was 89 to 95, right at the time where the world was transitioning from 
paper-based surveys to laptop surveys. And uh, I basically did a reorganization of the place, of the, of the survey operations, to go from the stovepipe, stovepipe setting to mixing all these guys around. Because a lot, of, you know, a lot of the coding stuff you have to do up front when you're programming the CADI program, or the, the CAPI program. Uh, so I, I, I totally reorganized that uh, with the help of, of uh, my colleagues at, at SRC. Uh, and then we implemented it. And that was a, a really an, an amazing experience. A little frightful and a little painful because you had people that had been doing stuff their way for 30 years, and it's sometimes it's tough to get them to change. <laughs> and, well, this cannot have been planned. The, the math guy goes to become the stats guy, the, becomes the survey <laughs> sampling guy, becomes the project leader guy, is now director of operations, of survey operations. That's an interesting metamorphosis. Is it, is it simply a matter of being open to new opportunities and possibilities that you hadn't really perhaps planned or thought? Uh, yes, it, it's totally a matter of that. If you recall, I said I always left myself open to different opportunities, even if they weren't exactly where I would necessarily want to go. And this was one where um, I invoked one of my other principles, which is I always stretch myself beyond the comfort level. <laughs> I had no idea whether I was going to be successful there or not. And in fact, a lot of people looked at me and they'd say, what's this punky kid doing here? At Director of Survey Operations, we need you know, someone with gray hair and stuff like that. <laughs> so uh, it, was, uh, it was a great experience. It was well, see, so you, you didn't have management training, and now you're doing a lot of working with people. What, mm -hmm. what, how did you do with that, and what, what, what lessons did you yeah, it, it was uh, an organic process. Um, so I didn't actually get a lot of training until I was at Michigan. Then halfway into my tenure there, the entire university launched a uh, total quality management initiative, and we all got training in everything from um, management and supervision to um, process improvement, to statistical quality control, and so forth. And that actually helped me go to the next, to, to a new level uh, as well. So I was able to get some pr practical training, but most of it was organic. Uh, trying things out and then seeing if they worked and didn't. So f or, uh, I hate to use this as an example, but it's a real learning process for anybody that might be listening. Um, you know, I'm, I've always been empathetic, and so when you gotta let go of somebody, um, it's tough. And so the first time I did it, I, basically, I was saying you're fired, but I was, I'd was i say, man, we've we got to let you go, but you can stay till, you know, for the rest of the week. Man, you just never, <laughs> you don't do that. <laughs> it causes so much problems. So I, I learned some lessons that, you know, if you're going to fire somebody, you just got to fire them. And you can do it in a very humane and, and constructive way. Uh, you can't control how, how people react to that, but you can control how you're going to present yourself and how, and you can present the situation as uh, a, you know, it's something that, you know, ultimately is going to be for everybody's benefit, both theirs and yours. Yeah, yeah working in an organization like Michigan, you're going to be surrounded by lots of brilliant no. and <laughs> probably somewhat difficult people. Alphas, yeah. lots of alphas. <laughs> so, how is the trick in navigating those shows? How did you? I, I don't know. I have this. Uh, I have this ability. I, I think it's because of both the logic training, as well as uh, the values that were instilled in parochial school and stuff like that that I carried with me, where I've been able to navigate really difficult situations, especially crisis situations where everybody's like, you know, fire. You got to fire Rob for this or that or whatever. And I'm like, hey, calm down. Let's like look at the facts and let's do this or that. So I've, I've had an ab ability where. The more a crisis becomes inflamed and grows, the calmer I get, and the more logical and simple the solutions are. And I've I've used that uh, ever ever since you know back at Michigan. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, how long at Michigan at survey operations? I was there for seven years. Another so. seven-year stint. Yep. Did it stay interesting? Did you keep learning on that job? Oh, absolutely. And in fact, I went over to NORC as the director of survey operations there. Mm -hmm. And um, I was there for three years until, and then got stolen away to Urban Institute. Uh, but there, that was a useful transition, too, because I started out uh, as director of survey operations, ended up as uh, vice president of uh, statistics and methodology. 
Uh, so that was a really nice, uh, that was a really interesting time. Uh, it was, uh, it wasn't the most, uh, uh, let's see, it was very stressful. There were a lot of things going on, um, a lot of internal issues. And uh, it was a great learning experience because I went in thinking, oh man, I've got seven years at SRC. I can just waltz in there and change the world. No. Nope. <laughs> Every organization's different. The culture's different. The power players are different. And, um, and you just got to learn how to navigate that. And uh, despite all the, the difficulties that I, I had initially there, I promised myself that I was going to find a way to contribute to that organization. And I totally did to the point of getting promoted. You know? <laughs> so uh, it, was, it was a really wonderful experience there, too. So mm -hmm. how would you advise someone who finds themselves in this work situation at an institution that might be somewhat fraught, that has a lot of uh, politics going on, mm -hmm. and a lot of strong personalities? It, it's actually pretty, pretty simple. My advice is really simple, and it's carried me all the way. And that's to stick to your values and stick to the mission of the organization. It's really hard for somebody to combat you if you demonstrate and articulate clearly that you're doing this for the advancement of the company as well as your fellow, fellow folks, uh, your fellow colleagues and such. It's really hard uh, for folks to, to suddenly say, no, that's not good. <laughs> it doesn't work that way, guys. <laughs> So it, and it really carries you. But that far. move to the vice president position took you back. Now now you've you've, you've kind of s stepped back over to statistics and methodology. Now, right, 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 right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What was the thinking there? Had you simply well, the, the, actually, to be honest, the thinking there was that the types of of accomplishment, not accomplishments, that the types of changes that I really thought needed to be made uh, in survey operations, I wasn't able to make as quickly as I wanted to, and I felt that I could be a, contribute much better uh, stepping outside of that realm and basically showing folks what I could do. Because, you know, when you're a manager, you can only show what you can do in management, and sometimes there's a perception that, oh, you know, they really don't know what's really going on in surveys and design and stuff. And this allowed me then to highlight my other side, which is you know statistical, statistic des design, sampling, etc., and it was it was just marvelous. I had people asking for me all the time. <laughs> That's great. What were the greatest challenges you saw for the field at that time in terms of methods that you needed to address, and, and how did you go about it? Uh, I, th well, it was still in the midst, in the middle of the transition uh, to CAPI, so there was some of some of that. Uh, the, the challenge, I guess around that time, the, uh, for telephone interviews anyway, the response rates were starting to, to go down. This was like in the 90s, uh, 95 to 98 or so. And you could see evidence of that. It was getting tougher and tougher to get interviews. And uh, sure enough, you know, as you waltzed into the new millennia, <laughs> they just crashed. It was like the stock market crash. <laughs> and, uh what did you? What was your response to that? How did how did you well, suggest the, how to deal with it? Yeah, at the time um, there was a lot of stuff we were doing that really involved. Um, it was sort of the precursor to adaptive design, and so we used a lot of replicated, or I would use a lot of replicated sampling, so that you could learn from early replicates uh, how to deal with the later replicates in terms of different you know strategies and things of that sort. So we did some of that. Uh, the, the other thing was to do a, a non-response study, which is a separate sample of the non-respondents as of a particular point in time. And then you do much more heavily uh, allocate resources and strategies to get a higher response rate there so that you could look for patterns and potential non-response bias uh, for that. And at the time, those types of efforts worked. It's really difficult nowadays to do a non-response study because if they're not going to respond nowadays, they're not going to respond. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Really neat. Okay, so then Urban Institute comes calling. Yep, they come calling. How did that happen? Um, the the vice president, uh, senior vice president at Urban, decided he he thought that there should be a more of a senior statistical uh, person that's guiding and helping the researchers at Urban Institute come up with better designs and implementation. And so they brought me in in that sense. 
to basically be a resource and help folks. And so I, I ended up doing that and I absolutely loved it because we trans I, had, I, I had up to this point been solely in academically based uh, survey research centers, which meant that the end purpose for a lot of these studies we were doing were journal articles in publications. And I really felt, uh, I was starting to feel more of a draw to to have to see more impact of the research that was being done, and by going to urban, you know, we'd walk around and say, "Oh, you know, Congress is going to be, you know, coming up on this issue with uh, with uh, social benefits, and we really need to to do a study to come up with facts, you know, that and uh, an assessment that we can then provide to the public so that there can be a better discourse." for that as opposed to, oh, I, I'm getting a journal article. Now, having said that, there's still plenty of folks, we do a lot of, you know, journal, art, uh, journal level research and, and publish in journals, but the real focus and mission is on helping people and helping the public discourse, and I really like that, and it, I just navigated to that, and, and that's what drew me away, besides an offer I couldn't refuse. Right. Any particular projects you've done that especially um, I've, uh, there's, there are a few, yeah. Uh, my absolute favorite is uh, I've been involved in a series of housing discrimination studies. Um, there's, there have been a number. Back in 2000, uh, we did one for uh, minorities, uh, basically discrimination against minorities, which is looking after the Fair, uh, Fair Housing Act. And um, we, uh, this, I created this amazing sample design. I was, I'm so proud of it. It involved going to newspapers. We would have around the country uh, 20 different newspapers flown in on Sunday morning, send somebody out to pick, it up at the, pick them up at the airport, bring them in, tear out the real estate sections for sales and rental, lay the, lay the, the, uh, the newspapers out, and then I had these cardboard uh, sampling grids where I would cut out little clusters of area and we'd lay that on top circle the, the units, and then those would be the, the units. We'd go through and get eligibility and stuff, but those would be the units. We'd then send uh, facts out to different cities in the country so that the testers could then go and uh, send a white tester and a minority tester to the landlords to see if they, uh, how they would get differentially treated. So that was a lot of fun. We've moved up in the world. Now we do web scraping and sampling and such. But since then, we've been involved in things like uh, Housing discrimination, families and children, uh, disabilities, uh, and uh, m uh, let's see, mental health uh, types of things, um, and as well as minorities. So we've done a whole series, and we're doing some more. So, so that that's been a, a an all-time favorite. Yeah. yeah, this is what I was saying earlier when we talked about your childhood. Is that uh, you can see the steady stream across your career path of involvement in studies that are focused on underprivileged and underserved populations. Has that been intentional? Uh, yes, yes and no. I, um, well, mostly yes, yeah. I, I really, uh, that really uh, gets to my heart. You know, I, I very much want to help the world and do the best I can to help the substantive researchers to do the best that they can in terms of coming up with uh, good insights on policy issues. I actually went as far as getting into the qualitative realm. And so uh, about 10 years ago, for a few years, I was involved in a qualitative study to look at the impact of ICE raids uh, on uh, undocumented immigrants in their communities. And was I was doing things like uh, getting on small little you know, uh, airplanes, treetop airlines, to go out to Grand Island, Nebraska to interview folks and see what the impact was. It was it was a very eye-opening uh, experience and very rewarding too. Went out to LA and talked to some of those folks. It was it was really good and a nice compliment to the. And it, it actually helped me understand the value and appreciate the value of mixed methods, qualitative, quantitative. Uh, and I'm a huge proponent of that nowadays, as you might uh, tell if you look at my presidential address. Uh, I, I was talked to, I talked about those things, and I actually think it helps segue into uh, how big data can help us too, because I, I do think that, that there's some ties. 
similar times there. Yeah, it's interesting that here's a, the sampling statistician that's going out and doing qualitative interviews. Yep. <laughs> there, I think there's a message there for other researchers right, in terms of broadening the horizon. Yeah, and actually one of the most fun things I did was a sample design for qualitative research. Because, yeah, people say, oh, it's, it's qualitative research, just go and get some volunteers. That's absolutely not the way to do it. Uh, there, there are some really, uh, you have to go dig way down deeper in that and use conceptual frameworks to help guide who you want, why you want them, and what you intend to learn. So, Super interesting. Yeah. All right, I think we're at the point back into your life. That's right? absolutely correct. Uh, how did this happen? Uh, well, I was at Urban for a few years uh, doing my thing, you know, with my sampling grids and uh, doing the housing discrimination and other studies. And uh, he came knocking. It turns out that around 1980, he left the Survey Research Center at Michigan and founded his own company, social science research company in Austin, Texas, called Newstats. And it was, you know, bumping around for 20 years or so. And he decided he wanted to grow it and uh, sell it and retire, you know, become a millionaire. And so he needed, or he wanted someone to help him do that. And so he reached out to me and said, come be my partner and we'll do good things together. And so we, uh, again, offer I couldn't refuse. I went back to Texas, went back home, uh, lived, ended up living there for uh, six years, seven years, uh, no, six years, uh, 2001 to 2006. And we grew the company significantly, did some really amazing and important work. And, um, and then uh, came back to Urban after we sold it to the Germans. <laughs> <laughs> so flexibility and willingness to try new things seems to be a hallmark here. Yeah, it was pretty scary too. You know, when you have to put your home up to make sure you can cover the the payroll. You know, <laughs> that wow. was that was a little scary. <laughs> yeah. But, but know, it was very rewarding. I mean, we did we did some amazing studies. We got we got a contract from NIST to do a survey of the survivors of the World Trade Center collapse. And uh, we had to track them down because all we had was uh, the, the entry badges, information from the entry badges, which was name and city. Uh, so we tracked them down, uh, did a uh, stratified sample according to where they were, what floor they were on in the buildings, um, and uh, then also did some in-depth, in-person interviews where we had tablets and we asked uh, that had blueprints or schematics of every floor, and we asked them to trace everything they saw, heard, smelled, etc., from the time that the incident, a uh, plane crash happened, all the way to when they exited the building. And it was very useful, actually, for NIST because that helped them to, ter to determine things like why, uh, why the building collapsed. Uh, you know, uh, in, in terms of you know some of the things that they were they were looking at and picked up. Wow, amazing project. Now, was the plan always to do that? Till Carlos could sell it, and then back to the Urban Institute. Or no, no, sense? we're supposed to both become rich and famous, but he got rich and famous, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I got I got some uh, some funds to help my uh, uh, kids get to college. So that was good. So it it turned out great. Did some great work, uh, and um, I got to work again with my wife. Uh, she, she since she had she uh, left her position. She was at Westhead actually, and. Um, so we came back to Urban, and I quickly got her involved in the Texas Top Ten uh, study. Uh, uh, Martha Tienda at Princeton, she's a famous uh, demographer, social scientist, and uh, she got a study to look at the impact of the Baki case, where um, uh, it ended affirmative action, and so Texas implemented the Top Ten rule that said every kid who graduates from a public Texas high school in the top 10% can have immediate access to any uh, Texas university that they want. And uh, so uh, there was fears of brain drain and all this other stuff. And we did a, a longitudinal study to see the impact of that. And we found that there wasn't much of an impact. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, throughout this period, you've been at Urban since, right? So this is, mm -hmm. this is now, it looks like you're pretty well set. Yeah, I've been there for 10 years, yeah. Right. Another dramatic career change is perhaps not in the card. Well, it's interesting. Uh, like I said, part of my principle is that I never say never. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, I will, and I have to do that. I mean, that's just who I am. I'm, I'm always uh, available to listen and, 
and also I'm doing my thing, you know, in terms of just making the most out of the position that I have and trying to enjoy life and do have fun, you know. Well, now, throughout this period, you've been involved in APOR. How did that come around? What, what got you in APOR in the first place? Uh, director of Survey Operations at Michigan. So I started in 89, and it was clear to me then that I needed to go to field directors and a conference as well as to, to APOR. And I believe my first conference was in 1990. And I pretty much come to every annual conference since then except maybe one. Uh, so uh, that, that's how I got involved. And um, I was accustomed to the, you know, six to 10,000 people coming to the joint statistical meetings at ASA, gigantic. Um, and I found it so refreshing to come to a small, well, small, much smaller uh, setting uh, of about 800 to 1,000. I think back when I started, it was more like 600. Um, and everybody knows everyone. We're supportive of each other. We help each other out. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a competitor or not. We're colleagues in the survey research industry and the social science industry, including uh, qualitative research, marketing research, et cetera. And uh, we just, we support each other and, and we, we move forward and we're advancing our, our industry and our community. Uh, and that's so refreshing that I, I, I needed more of it. <laughs> And is that what got you to the council position? Uh, yes, absolutely. Well, I, I, interestingly, when I was at Temple, my first job, I was what's called an isolated statistician, which means I was the only guy there that knew statistics. And so I wanted and needed a sense of community. So I got into American Statistical Association and immediately got on committees and doing this and that. And my community then became everyone around the country. And what I found is, you know, going back to Michigan as director of survey operations, I was in a similar type of, of setting where, you know, uh, I didn't have a lot of colleagues because there's, you know, I was kind of like on top of that mini food chain type of thing. And, um, and so I looked to be a part of a broader community and help the community with what I was learning and get back from the community so I could learn some more stuff. And uh, so I became, I've always been very active in, in, uh, in APOR and, um, and American Stat Association. Yeah, no, it seems so. you um, talked in your early days of growing up about your recognition of the need to give back. And uh, you've been giving back in a lot of ways, giving voice to people who didn't otherwise have had it. Yeah, I've, I've, doing, I've done it a number of different ways. In the early days, um, my focus was primarily on helping uh, Latino minority students get their PhDs because they would always need help with their analysis and I was always there for them. Uh, my sister uh, went to um, University of Houston Health Science Center in, in Houston and she was always sending you know, uh, grad students to me and I, I was always helping them out and I absolutely loved it. Um, and then later on, I started more of a mentoring type of thing. Uh, and that's been really, um, really rewarding because then you get to work directly with someone and uh, do things like, uh, uh, set things up like, okay, we have a client meeting uh, next week. What is it that we want to accomplish and how are we going to do it? So let's set some goals rather than just going to the meeting and, you know, saying, oh, you know, what's the agenda and stuff like, you know, what do we need to walk out with? And, and sort of strategically start preparing them and, and setting their mind toward on how to be the most effective they could be, not only in terms of research, but also in terms of managing a project too. So I, I, I like sort of that multi-setting thing. And then the third thing is that um, I think the, the recruitment offices hate me because I'm always getting contacted by folks and saying, hey, I think I know, might know an organization that knows you, and then I'll go talk to someone at RTI or someone at Westat or someone at APT uh, and say, hey, here, you know, here's someone who's looking, you know, keep it quiet, but you think you might want to <laughs> take a look at them. And so I've, I've placed a number of people that way. That's been very rewarding. Now, you're, you're known to have a life outside of statistics and survey research as Absolutely. well. Absolutely, yeah. Something mm -hmm. about catching fish, taking photos, a couple other things. Yeah, I, uh, I uh, my the buddy that I grew up with next door, uh, we we learned fishing with with tortilla masa, you know, at, at Woodlawn Lake, and uh, we've kept that up. Uh, so every year we go for a week off to the Texas coast, and uh, we go we go fishing on the Texas coast, catch some great redfish and trout and floundering, 
And um, but we can't go deep sea fishing because I get I turn green immediately. <laughs> so it's always in real shallow <laughs> shallow waters. Uh, so that's a, a total love. Uh, the other the other thing that I I I absolutely love is photography. And I don't know what happened to me. Maybe it was that I started going to the Austin City Limits festivals. Uh, they're over a weekend in in October. And one time. I saw these guys in the pit taking pictures, and I said, "Man, I want to do that. I want to. I want to be a you know a music, uh, live music photographer." And so I just picked up a camera, and somehow found a way to get into the get, get media credentials. And I, I shot Austin City Limits a couple of times for a magazine in New York. Then they figured out that I didn't, didn't know crap about photography, so they threw me off. <laughs> but by then, I'd learned enough to get a good portfolio. And then I, I was able to get into the South by Southwest scene, and I've uh, I've been shooting that for like five or six years now, and worked my way up to also in terms because I have management skills, worked my way up into being their photo crew chief as well. So uh, it's it's just everything that you learn as uh, through the photography experience. It to me has applications to to survey research, the creativity, the framing. Uh, the tailoring, uh, all the different situations. You know, every project has a problem. You know, every ph photo session has an issue. Um, and, um, and so I've, I've just, it's been really rewarding doing that as well. It's a new crowd. It also allows me to go to, to the South By sessions itself. And I look, uh, almost all of my ideas that I brought to APOR and to the American Statistical Association have come from South by Southwest EDU, where they have latest innovations in education, and South by Southwest Interactive, where they find new and creative ways of using technology and apps to help serve communities. They even have community service awards as part of South by Interactive, which I totally love. Well, I'm sorry, but we've still left out the passion of yours that is of most interest to me personally, which is, of course, barbecue. Oh, oh, I love grilling. <laughs> In fact, anybody on Facebook <laughs> knows <laughs> that uh, I will, because I'm, I've been blessed to be able to uh, continue my tenure at, uh, at Urban Institute as chief methodologist, but uh, live in Austin, Texas now, because I moved back uh, over a year ago. And I work out on my dining room table, and uh, about th uh, Four, four out of four or five times out of the week, about four o'clock, I go out and start the grill, and I'm always grilling something. <laughs> it's just amazing. I've I've learned some really good recipes. I also bake a lot, uh, and my favorite pastime is making pancakes for my four-year-old grandbaby. <laughs> yeah, it's great. <laughs> so it's really cool to look back over this landscape of your career, which has been so interesting, cross-disciplinary, really creative every step of the way. I think it's neat. Thinking back across it, and now thinking about young research, mm -hmm. the challenges our field faces, and, and the possibilities and opportunities they face as well, uh, what sort of advice would you would you give the next generation coming up? I would uh, tell the next generation to embrace uncertainty. As I've said many times, and I, I think Michael Link likes to repeat, uh, note this that I, I honestly believe we're in a Renaissance period. Now, in any Renaissance period, there are folks that say the sky is falling, uh, and there are others that see opportunity. I think there is great opportunity to find ways to leverage new methods, including non-probability methods, to gain insight, not necessarily to generate point estimates with margins of error, but to gain knowledge, to, to, to learn something. And I think you can do that with New, the new data approaches, the new methods of, of uh, quasi-surveys like opt-in sampling and such, I don't see them as the same, at the same level or answering the same types of research questions as you need for the gold standard probability surveys. Uh, but I do see lots of opportunity. And so I'd say keep an open mind uh, and remember that the goal is to learn, to gain knowledge not necessarily to get a point estimate of something. There are many different types of research questions, and if you frame that correctly, you can do a lot with a little data. Rob Santos, thank you. Thanks oh, for thank your you. contributions to our field and to our association. Ah, this was lovely. I hope I'm not being put out to pasture now. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>